Welcome to the Nottingham Business School Business Leaders Podcast, where business leaders tell their stories and share their insights. All our guests have a personal connection with Nottingham Business School, so listen, learn, enjoy and share. Welcome to the latest episode of the Nottingham Business School Business Leaders Podcast with me, Mike Sassy. Editor and journalist Neil Benson has spent a lifetime in journalism. He started as a trainee on the Sheffield Star newspaper and ended up as editorial director of Britain's biggest local newspaper group, Trinity Mirror. Along the way, he edited both the Newcastle Chronicle and the Coventry Telegraph when they were selling tens of thousands of copies every night. Neil now chairs the Editor's Code of Practice Committee, which sets the professional standards for journalists in the UK. He also lectures on leadership. In recent months, he has published a genuinely fascinating memoir, intriguingly titled, You Can't Libel the Dead. So for listeners who haven't spent a life in journalism, I'll certainly be asking him to explain that one. Neil Benson, welcome to the Nottingham Business School Business Leaders Podcast. Thank you, Mike. So we better get that one out of the way. Um, explain that book title, You Can't Libel the Dead. Well, uh, it goes back a long way, some 40 plus years. And I was, I was in a, a classroom uh, uh, receiving a law lecture with a group of other uh, young, wet behind the ears journalists. And the lecturer had sort of terrified us to death about all the legal perils that we, we might face. But he finished up by saying, hey, but the good news is you can't libel the dead. Um, and so, you know, as a young journalist, that's one of those phrases that is always going to stick with you. And so when I was writing the book, uh, this is wine forward 40 odd years, uh, I was chatting to a friend of mine and he said, oh, you better take care not to land yourself in court. And I said, yeah, but you can't libel the dead. And we looked at each other and we both said, that's got to be the title. And, and, and it's a great title. It's a cracking read as well. I mean, you mentioned 40 odd years there. Um, so. You know, half of that time was spent in, in, in quite senior leadership roles. Anything you know now that you, you wish you'd known when you started? Well, I suppose the, the really big one is I wish that we'd known how devastating the Internet was going to be uh, in terms of the industry's business model and how it revolutionised and, you could say, devastated the industry from my start in the 70s to, to where we are today. Um, and I think in hindsight, uh, if we'd known that, we'd have probably moved faster and taken some more radical decisions uh, about responding to to the the challenges of the internet. But I suppose having said that, each time that we restructured our newsrooms, and we, as you know, we did that quite often. Uh, I think I was involved in 40 plus restructures over 15 years or so. Um, Each time we were being more radical, trying to take more calculated risks than we'd ever done before. And I think you have to remember that this was an industry that had been in an extremely profitable, uh, steady state for more than 100 years. Uh, And we'd never faced anything anywhere near as disruptive or of this magnitude ever before. So I guess that would be the one thing I'd like to (laughs) like to have known uh, earlier than I I did. Um, I guess from a from a personal leadership point of view, though, those years of disruption uh, provided a huge professional challenge. Um, and I think that all of us who were involved in it uh, learned a huge amount about how to deal with change, how to lead change, and also how to respond positively to failure because we were dealing with areas that were brand new to us and we were never going to get 100% of it right. Um, and probably the final thing would, would be around, um, as a leader, maintaining team spirit in these extremely testing circumstances. I think that was one of the hardest things to try and keep people feeling committed and on board. Can I need to prepare for change of that magnitude? I think it's difficult. Um, it, it was because it's all a no. Um, there was a, a feeling within our business that uh, from the senior levels that, oh, this is just a cyclical change and we're used to dealing with those and it'll all sort of wash its way through. Um, so I think the first internet revolution around about 2000, it kind of, threatened to go up like a, a rocket, but then, you know, it never, it was a bit of a damp squib really. And that gave a lot of people 
ammunition to say, ah, this internet is not going to be any different whatsoever. We'll deal with it like we have before. Somebody will pull the plug out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when, so when the sort of second coming of the internet, when it really gripped around about 2005, I suppose, uh, th there were a lot of naysayers who were saying, no, we spent a lot of money. We didn't need to first time around when it didn't work. So, you know, let's just carry on doing our knitting, uh, which proved to be the wrong call. Yes, and, and, there, and, there, and there aren't many papers, uh, papers left now. Really, papers of stature. You, 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 you look around the, you look around the industry. What do you, what do you think when you, when you look around and see what was and what is now? Well, there's, there's some terrible news in there, but I think there's some hope as well. Um, I guess when, when I started work at the Sheffield Star, that evening paper was selling 120,000 copies a night. Um, now, I've not looked at the figures lately, but it's probably about 10% of that. Um, so all the money that was attracted through advertising and, and the cover price revenue from readers um, has largely gone. Um, the, the upside of it all, though, is that the audience now, uh, having declined since the Second World War in a steady sort of uh, slow decline, um, the audience now, since the internet's arrived, is bigger than ever. Uh, you know, there's more and more people uh, choosing to read local press. Uh, I think also through COVID, it became the go-to place to 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 get real, reliable news. The problem is, though, as we both know, that the money doesn't come with it. So that's that's now the crucial challenge. Okay, so let's go back to uh, let, let's go back to your career, back to the early days. Um, there's a line in your book that where you say that. After a dinner with with the prime minister, I mean, so presumably you were editorial director then, and um, uh, I think it might have been John Major. I'm not. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you pinched yourself at the success of a working class lad from a Sheffield council estate. Did you did you not always think you'd be a successful leader right from the start? Um, no, uh, I, I think that looking looking back to sort of my sort of school days and college you know I sort of tend to push myself to the front a bit and sort of enjoyed being the captain of the team and that sort of thing house captain um but without really thinking about what that entailed I think probably just you know ego wise I just sort of like the idea of it um but it, it, it sort of crystallized a bit when when I was at journalism school and our lecturer asked the class that, that towards the end of the year that we were there um so what are your ambitions, if you've got any, for, for your career? And most people were, were sort of being sort of quite sort of reserved and polite about it. And so I just stuck my hand up and said, uh, well, I'd like to work on a national paper at some point to prove that I could do well at that sort of level, which I saw as, as, as being, you know, sort of high at the high end of, of the industry. Um, and then eventually to edit a regional evening title, because... I, I, as a teenager, I'd worked as a Saturday copy boy uh, on the Greenan, which was the, the sports edition of the Sheffield Star from about the age of 15. And I absolutely loved the immediacy of evening newspapers. Um, so it wasn't a sort of cast iron belief that being an editor was my destiny. Um, it was more a kind of rough sketch of a career path that I was hoping to follow. Um, and, and I was fortunate. I mean, that's that's the way it turned out. But I, I guess I'm, I'm the sort of person I, and I, I suppose this is like most leaders, really. I need a goal to aim for, to give me a, a, a focus, and I, I just don't like to let things drift. Well, and there's, a, there's an interesting line in, in, in your book. Um, um, you, you, know, you, talk, you were in a meeting when the chief executive announced he was going to create this new senior rule, and, and, and you thought, wait a minute, I fancy that. It's got my name on it. So as soon as the meeting finishes, you, you call him and you say, look, I'm your man. And you say, and I'm guessing it was New Castle you were at the time because you say shy Ben's getting out <laughs> so is, do, do all leaders push themselves forward I think that probably depends what sex you are um there's a lot of research around um over the years that that shows that male managers tend to have a sort of an overinflated sense of self-belief uh, while women tend to underrate themselves uh, so I guess men tend to push themselves forward uh, and women is that don't. not changing though is that not changing uh, I, I think it. I, I can only say based on what I've observed. I think there is there is more. Maybe women are, are being more forthright. I mean, I always sort of think back to Margaret Thatcher, you know, and she was she was uh, 
you know, more male than all the men in the cabinet. You know, so she, it was the joke, you know, so she got there by being more male than they were. Whereas I think now I think things are changing. I, th I think in terms of what staff value from their leaders, the sort of softer skills about approachability, communication, empathy, emotional intelligence. Um, in my experience, women have those qualities more naturally than men do. So I think I think maybe is it women pushing themselves forward more, or or is it a case of the world changing and the sort of times come for for women to to sort of take more leadership roles and be given more responsibility? Because the uh, there's a theme running through the recent podcasts that I've done here that uh, emotional intelligence is is every bit, if not more, important than uh, than classic intelligence. And um, what you have a strong feeling on that? Yeah, I, I think. I'd agree with that, uh, and I think that the the best leaders aren't always the cleverest people in the room. They're not always the most highly qualified people in the room, um, but they tend to, in my experience, tend to be the more balanced people in the room. Uh, the, the, certainly the, the, the leaders that I've learned most from and I've admired the most tend to have sort of a, a broad and balanced view of life uh, as well as business. Um, so I think the, uh, and I think staff, and, and this is backed up by, by lots of research, that staff appreciate that and they look for it more. I think particularly millennials now, you know, their view of life is maybe different to when we were sort of setting off on our road in journalism, where um, you just go for it and whatever it took, you'd get there and you'd move around and you'd uproot your family and, you know, they'd have to sort of trail in your wake. Whereas I think these days, I know my, my kids are in their late 20s, early 30s, and they all have a much kind of broader view of their life in total, including work, but without work being the absolute be all and end all. So I, I think maybe as leaders who are of an older generation, maybe we need to respond to that and to take it into account when we're dealing with younger people on our teams. OK, so back with your own career, as I say, I'll, I'll refer to your book again. It, there's, there's a lot of really colourful, interesting stories, quite compelling stuff, really, you know. Um, being confronted by angry football managers, Kevin Keegan and Kenny Dalglish, to name but two, um, you know, convicted murderers turning up in your office. I mean, it sounds really sexy and exciting, uh, but when you started, you earned less than the council bin man, he said. So do successful leaders choose their careers for love rather than money? I don't know. I mean, I suppose I, I just, I was a copy boy who sort of fell in love with the idea of journalism. I got chatting to a uh, uh, one of the duty reporters on a Saturday afternoon, and he seemed to be sort of quite a decent, engaging guy. And, you know, he got interviewing skills, so he, he looked interested in me. Uh, and that's what kind of set my juices going, I suppose. Um, I, I think uh, I've, I've never done it for the money. Uh, anybody entering journalism uh, at the sort of the first rung of the ladder would not be doing it for the money. Um, but it can be a great career, and I've been very fortunate in, in where it's in where it's taken me. Um, I, I'm sure that there are some leaders, maybe whose main motivation is money, have been successful and been good at, at being a leader. Um, but personally, I don't think that chasing the trappings of success is the route to take if you want to be sort of truly fulfilled in your in in your job. Um, um, I think doing work that stretches you, that's meaningful, and that you believe is worthwhile is really the route to sustaining yourself and your interest uh, over a long career. You'd, you'd advise would-be leaders, people just entering in the first rung of their career, just to go for something they enjoy? I think so. I, I think as, as a, the same advice that, you know, as editors we give to young wannabe journalists, you know, oh, what degree should I do? do? Should it be a journalism degree? No, just go and do a degree that you're interested in. Do something that you, you're going to enjoy doing for three years and then see where that takes you. And I think journalism, whatever it is that you see is the thing you want to do is, you know, follow your star. Uh, I mean, my, my son, um, I had a conversation with him when he was doing work experience on the sports desk of the Manchester Evening News as a 17 year old. And I drove him into the office uh, each day for a fortnight and I worked from there and kept, kept out of his way. And we were driving home one night and he was all enthusiastic. He had a really nice interview published in the paper. And, uh, I said to him, uh, you know, I, I laid out all the issues about the industry. You know, it's rocky, it's it's less predictable. It's uh, you know, you you might 
find that your job's at risk at some point. And he sat quietly while, while I gave him the dad talk. And in the end, he said, yeah, dad, but it's all I want to do. And I thought, yeah, you can't argue with that. You know, follow your star. Is he still doing it? He's just started a new job as head of audience engagement for Mail Online in New York. Oh, 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 oh. right. Well, uh, it just as well he knew his own mind. <laughs> yes, he was right. I was wrong. So you'd started talking about that generation of uh, that that generation of of, of, of worker of, of staff of people just entering their first their career. One of the things that um, that digital revolution post COVID fashion has given us is home working, um, mm. and yet the things that staff, particularly that generation, but staff overall, consistently say they want most from their leaders from their managers are the things that are that are difficult to, to deliver without face-to-face -face contact, you know, your approachability, personal support, human interaction, conversations like the one you've just outlined. So how do modern leaders deal with this kind of problem? Uh, this is something that I've spent quite a lot of time working on lately with uh, with, with publishers and, and other organisations outside the media industry. Um, and there's no doubt, is there, that it, it's, it's much harder to lead a team when you're working remotely. Uh, I've been doing some work recently with journalists based in North Africa, Kenya, um, Zimbabwe. Um, uh, and if we think in this country that the industry is challenged, then uh, have a look at what, what they've got to contend with. But, you know, dealing with remote teams, sometimes in war zones, I mean, it, it's incredibly difficult. Um, and trying to keep your team motivated in that circumstance, I mean, that really gave me a sort of sense of, perspective. But I guess coming back to um, the UK, hybrid working is here to stay. Um, you know, it works for people. Um, it brings your costs down because you don't need all the office space that you had before. There's lots of good reasons why I think it's going to uh, going to be the norm now. Um, uh, for me, the, the, there are sort of two key roles that I'd see for a leader in, in these circumstances. And I'll, I'll sort of when we're talking about this in, in uh, seminars, et cetera, I'd say you need to be the communicator in chief and the facilitator in chief. In chief, So it's about taking the initiative, I think checking in with staff regularly, more regularly than you would uh, if they were in the office with you, because you, you miss out on all those sort of bumping into each other conversations. Um, and I think it's also really important to keep your emotional antennae up. Um, I would always say start a conversation with your staff if you're doing a one-to-one -one with someone who's working remotely. Ask them how they are, how they're feeling. But it's not just one question. You know, if they don't say much, you know, stick with that for a bit. Uh, try and give them an opportunity uh, to open up. So I, I think the, the leader needs to really think about active listening, really listening to, to what they're saying and maybe what they're not saying and trying to tease out anything that might be in the background that's not working right for them because in the office people have got an opportunity to to raise these issues sitting on your own in a in a in a in a bed sit somewhere maybe you haven't and you feel a bit lonely so i think it's the leader's role to to really uh, try and tease that out um and, and in terms of being the facilitator in chief i think that's really about removing the barriers and solving problems to allow your staff to to do the things they need to do to get get all the nonsense out of the way so that they can do their job and, and that might even start with the basics so is their kit up to spec you know is this this sort of these hygiene factors in, in the management jargon uh, is their broadband working properly you know these sort of things and th these are sort of day-to-day -day things that are massive issues for the individual that may be on, on on top of the leader's list but sort them out and your staff will love you for it it, it's interesting isn't it? because um, I, I've read something else that you've written, but how the world has changed for leaders. I mean, something that you wrote, these are that leaders used to used to lead from the front and rather now they offer their sage advice from the back. <laughs> it's that, that's, so you have to be a completely different type of person. Um, I, I think you can be the same person, but I mean, we all develop along along the way, don't we? And, and I think maybe when when we set off on our careers, we we would know some of the same people who were you know very gung ho um, you know were the best um, practitioner in the room 
So the editor would often be the best journalist in the newsroom, and the same would apply in other industries and sectors. Um, and I think these days it's um, we're not digital natives. Anybody over 40 is probably not a digital native. So it's harder for us, even as hard as we might try, to understand digital and really wrap our heads around it. So I think it's it's more about understanding and accepting that and then finding and developing the talent that that these sort of things do come to naturally and helping to facilitate them. And I, I use there's a bit of a glib phrase, but um, I, I'd, I'd often say when we're having discussions around leadership development, you know, be a bit less Han Solo and a bit more Yoda. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so what you're saying is effectively there isn't really any such thing as a born leader. It's a phrase that used to be used to be banded around a lot. Now it's it's something that you really have to work out. That it's something that you have to sort of um, uh, you know, think through and, and and constantly be upskilling yourself through. No, com completely agree with that. I think I think um, one of the, the the people that I look up to most, who uh, was my boss a, a number of years ago, you wouldn't say he was a natural leader, but he really worked at it and he, he thought about it and he, he thought about developing himself as a leader in the same way he would think about developing his basic vocational skills and and broaden himself out and listen and learn along the way. Um, so I, I do think that that's we need to as leaders we need to be more open-minded and listen more and be prepared to change and adapt in terms of changing and adapting something that you mentioned earlier how um younger generations have a different attitude to to work and i guess and to leadership as well um and so therefore um they don't see work necessarily as the be all and end all um I, traditionally leaders are, are there 24 hours a day but that's that, that's difficult so how do how do how do leaders um, adapt, change, maintain that healthy balance between work and family life? You, you should probably be asking my wife, Mike, about this <laughs> to see whether I actually achieved it. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure I did. Certainly not 100 percent of the time. Um, I, I think um, my so I, being an editor was probably the time when there's most pressure on you for the most number of hours in the day. Uh, very difficult to sort of walk away from there's always an issue that's urgent and it's it's difficult just to say yeah, yeah you just get on with it I mean I, I I do think we need to trust our teams but in in the end the book is stopping with you so you if, if someone's asking you for an opinion you need to give it and be available um what I did was to all because uh, when I was editing the Chronicle in Newcastle our kids were sort of between newborn and three three of them um, and they were quite a handful so I would make every effort to get home in time to put them to bed and read them a story. Um, what would usually happen is that I'd start the story and by the end of the second page I'm asleep and they're kind of nudging me to, to say dad dad you know what happens next um, but I, th I think trying to have a, a few they're not unbreakable rules but things you try and live by. Um, I think the, the other thing personally that that helped me was uh, I've always been interested in sport and taking part in it and uh, I've been a runner all my adult life and I found that getting out for a run early in the morning would clear my head and set me up for the day that's probably why I was falling asleep at about seven o'clock but that's the, that's the quid pro quo I guess but I, I think having trying to give some sort of structure to your family life so that they don't get squeezed out perhaps yeah, and, and that feeds very nicely into, into my final question. So as you know, this is a, a podcast for the Nottingham Business School, a place full of current and would-be leaders. And if you had one piece of advice for all the people in there, um, I mean, you've just talked about your family balance, but outside of that, I guess, what would it be? I'm probably going to give you more than one here, but I, I would, I would tell <laughs> Everybody does, don't worry. Everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, look, listen. Um, Learn good behaviours from people around you. And that doesn't always mean the, the top person in the organisation. It can be the most junior person in the organisation. But look at what good leadership... Everybody's, all, everybody's always looking at you as the leader, yeah. So make sure they're looking at something that works. I, I think you, can, you, you often see really good leadership behaviours all around you uh, at, at all levels in the organisation. And don't be afraid to steal those behaviours from the best people. I, I think you don't want to try and clone yourself on someone else but uh, one of my uh, managing directors over the years always used to say 
you know, I've taken 5% from him and 5% from her and a few percent from over here, it's just, which is really what he's saying is I'm learning as I as I go along and I, I'm picking up the, the best leadership behaviours. Um, the, the, the other thing, if I might have a second uh, stab at this, um, I think trying to achieve a balance between being assertive and being humble. Um, there was there was a, an anecdote here around when I worked in uh, in the northeast. Uh, I was at a dinner party and there was uh, the chairman of a large northeast company um, was uh, telling us about uh, there was a bit of a race going on to become the new chief executive and he would be chairing the panel that chose him. And he said, you know, there's two people really in the running here. Um, and one of them is kind of like a safe option. The other one is a bit more of a wild card, but he's got a lot of talent. And he says, but the problem is he hasn't learned the value of humility. And I thought that was a lovely phrase. And then he got the job. And within two years, the company had crashed. It was a big national story at the time. And I, I, that always stuck with me, you know, learn the value of humility. Um, but balancing that with being assertive. So um, there's a, a definition of assertiveness that I really like. Uh, it says that assertiveness is being able to stick up for yourself and others without being a real jerk. And yeah, <laughs> I think that's probably not a bad motto for life. Yeah, I think I learned that. Stick up for yourself and for others without being a real jerk. Neil Benson, thank you very, very much for joining us here on the Not In A Business School Business Leaders Podcast. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode, then why not check out some of the others that are also available, including those with the chair of the FA, Debbie Hewitt, broadcaster and entrepreneur, David Lloyd, and the vice chancellor of Nottingham Trent University, Professor Edward Peck. The Nottingham Business School Business Leaders podcast is produced for Nottingham Trent University by Celtic Tiger Productions. Your presenter was Mike Sassy, and your producer was John Collins.